A few years ago, a heated debate that ended in the first war of the Bitcoin world took place. The disagreement was about how large blocks of the blockchain should be, how easy it should be to change Bitcoin's rules and ultimately it was about control. Welcome back to another video here on the channel. Today I'll talk about the block size war which took place between about 2015 to 2017 and was very well documented by the author Jonathan Beer in his book The Block Size War. A few of Elon's tweets recently let people dig into the trade-offs of bigger blocks again, because it's not as simple as he proposes. Let's go into a bit of an overview at first to understand the whole disagreement, before really diving deep and understanding the characters involved and also walking through the events chronologically. The main disagreement was about the following points. Should blocks be full or consistently have a surplus capacity? Should the protocol rules concerning block size change easily or be robust and only change if the vast majority wants them to change? The significance to run a node as a normal user and if you should prioritize gaining market share quickly in a sort of startup fashion or focus on the long term where you need to think decades ahead to make decisions. Sergio Lerner summarized it quite accurately. There are two groups of people which have two different visions for Bitcoin. None of these visions is wrong. One group values more things like decentralization, lack of government, censorship resistance, anonymity. This group thinks that Bitcoin will transform our world in 20 to 30 years. To reach this goal, it's of utter importance to stick to those values. There is no rush. The other group values more things like reaching 1 billion users in the next 5 years or serving real unbanked users today, even if that requires a political agreement now. Both visions have their merits, but they are incompatible. In short, large blockers focus on short-term prioritization, user experience, growth and are more business focused. The small blockers focus on long-term prioritization, system resilience, sustainability and are more scientific and theoretical instead of business driven. And large blocks certainly sound like a really good idea at first. I mean, more transactions per second and cheaper transactions are a great deal. But there are multiple drawbacks. Number one, larger blocks lead to larger blockchains that make it harder to run for the average user. This means less nodes and thereby less decentralization. Second, transaction fees are necessary when the block subsidy gets lower and lower through the halving every four years to incentivize the miners. Third, it's a protocol rule change. We will see later why a robustness of the existing rules is one of the most important elements of Bitcoin. The first but certainly not last proposal by the big blockers that argued Bitcoin needs bigger blocks to keep transactions cheap was Bitcoin XT. It was a suggestion that would increase the block size from 1 megabyte to 8 megabytes and doubling every two years until 2036 where the block size would be around 8 gigabytes. The software update would be incompatible with existing nodes, which means it's a hard fork a widening instead of a tightening of the existing rules. Bitcoin XT was created by Mike Hearn and gained a lot of traction after Gavin Andresen said he will support it. When Satoshi, the creator of Bitcoin, left the project in 2012, Gavin Andresen sort of became the leader of the Bitcoin project as Satoshi asked him if he can put Gavin's email address on the Bitcoin homepage. I was the person everyone would email when they wanted to know about Bitcoin. Satoshi started stepping back as the leader of the project and pushing me forward as the new leader of the project. Gavin was really respected in the community and seen as the main guy, and was also the first paid Bitcoin developer. This gave Bitcoin XT a lot of credibility. The large blocker camp also certainly had the lead when it came to social media at the time. In general, most of the posts were in support of the larger blocks. The larger block message was clear and simple. Bitcoin needed more capacity. To the casual observer, the arguments against this were typically highly complex and somewhat confusing. And on top of this, one megabyte just seemed like a low number and the history of computer science was about capacity growing exponentially. At first, there actually was no block size limit. Satoshi introduced a one megabyte block size limit in the summer of 2010 without really giving any explanation of it. But this was quite typical for him. The reason probably was that blocks larger than 32 megabyte could have broken the system at this point. However, there is no indication that the one megabyte limit was a permanent solution that Satoshi seeked. Satoshi made many comments during the first two years of his involvement in the space, many of which could be said to support either side of the war. In general, it could be said that the quotes indicate that Satoshi seemed to broadly support the large blockers with respect to the narrow issue of the block size limit and the transaction throughput, but Satoshi seemed somewhat supportive of the smaller block position with respect to their view on the flexibility of the Bitcoin rules. In 2015, he once again engaged in the block size war with one email. Many suspect though that it was hacked, but even if it was not him, the message is important. Bitcoin was designed to be protected from the influence of charismatic leaders, even if their name is Gavin Andresen, Barack Obama or Satoshi Nakamoto. 
nearly everyone has to agree on a change, and they have to do it without being forced or pressured into it. This is a very key point in my opinion, because it dismantles the idea that if Satoshi wanted to have big blocks, then we should have big blocks. It's not known if he changed his mind during the discussion with more and more information available, and it doesn't really matter either. If he could decide protocol rule changes, Bitcoin would be a failed project. If two developers can fork Bitcoin and succeed in redefining what Bitcoin is, in the face of widespread technical criticism and through the use of populist tactics, then I have no choice to declare Bitcoin a failed project. Big blockers wanted to have blocks that are not full to have cheap transactions. These small blockers were convinced that full blocks are necessary in the long run anyway. If there is no surplus of transactions, there is no fee bidding. Due to the block reward halving every 4 years, the miners would have less and less of an incentive to mine blocks in case there are no transaction fees. This is known as a fee market death spiral. Here again you can see how small blockers thought decades ahead and preferred sustainability instead of faster adoption. During the block size war there were several conferences from Montreal to Hong Kong where it eventually became clear that an 8 megabyte block size is not the way to move forward. This led to Bitcoin XT being basically dead. An increase to 2 megabytes was still on the table though. I thought about the immense pressure which would be exerted on Bitcoin by major economic and political players as Bitcoin grows. It would make what Mike and Gavin were doing look minuscule by comparison. I began to realize that the rules of the network had to be robust. It doesn't matter who is trying to change the rules or whether it's a good idea or not. And this as I already said is a key realization. Bitcoin succeeds because it proves its inability to change. It just exists whether you like it or not and you can't control it or change the rules to your liking. Introducing a change led by two people who want to exert control would lead to more changes by individuals that simply shouldn't happen. It has to be really difficult to change a rule. It reminded me of a quote from Winston Churchill. Democracy is the worst form of government, except for all the others. Perhaps a system in which the status quo rules prevail, unless there is overwhelming consensus for change, is the worst form of Bitcoin governance, except for all the others. What made the war really interesting moving forward is that a Bitcoin developer found a way to increase the block size through a soft work rather than a hard fork, which means the new client is not incompatible with the previous client. The solution is called segregated witness or segwit for short. This meant that the signature data received a discount in calculation, but the overall limit would be around 2 megabytes, which is of course what many people seem to want, a block size limit increase to around 2 megabytes. The proposal was simply so good there were no valid arguments against it. This of course was a huge win for the small blockers who didn't want a hard fork and a potential chain split happening afterwards. The problem was that SegWit was extremely complicated, not even every developer understood it. And this is sort of a reoccurring theme. The small blockers had the most technically complicated ideas that are not easy to communicate and often misunderstood. To make SegWit a reality it first needs to be developed and then 95% of miners, an overwhelming majority, need to signal support for SegWit to activate it. This is also the same with the recent Taproot update, which now has a 99% support and is already logged in and will activate in November. Another advantage of the SegWit soft fork was that it enabled the Lightning Network, a transaction scaling solution that doesn't involve larger blocks. In Lightning you don't broadcast the transaction to everyone but just to the peer you want to transact with over a few routes through a payment channel. If you close a payment channel there is a final settlement over the blockchain. This means you can have an infinite amount of Lightning transactions within a single blockchain entry. And this makes sense for normal payments, because if someone buys a coffee in France using Bitcoin, why should a merchant selling concert tickets in Japan need to examine that transaction? The rising fees due to higher demand and small blocks drove merchants away. This was of course frustrating to the big blockers which were more focused on the business side of Bitcoin. However, to the smaller blockers, Bitcoin was not a business, nor a payment system taking on Visa, PayPal and Mastercard. It was a new form of money, something far more ambitious and potentially far more transformational to society and the economy. In general, small blockers had nothing against Bitcoin becoming a fast and cheap payment system. It just came second behind their main priority, which was a robust and new form of money. In January 2016, Mike Hearn, the Bitcoin XT developer, was so frustrated with the progress of the debate that he claimed Bitcoin was a failed project and that he will sell all his coins. After he rage quitted, he was sort of replaced by Jihan Wu, the co-CEO of Bitmain, which produced mining equipment and ran mining pools. After Bitcoin XT was dead, a new proposal emerged on the big blocker side, which was Bitcoin Classic, and it was also supported by some large industry players, including Coinbase. It was growing in popularity, however had massive weaknesses when it came to the activation, that were only understood by really technically adept people. 
Bitcoin appeared to me to be heading into a major crisis and split. At this point in the war, the larger block side were in a stronger position than they had ever been, while the smaller blockers still had some tricks left up their sleeves. Bitcoin felt on the brink of a catastrophic failure. After Jihan Wu, another player entered the game. This guy. Dr. Craig Wright, also known as Fake Toshi. Craig Wright, who is a big blocker, stated that he is Satoshi Nakamoto, and Gavin Andresen stated that he saw cryptographic proof for this. This is the point where many things went downhill for the big blockers. A lot of them believed in Fake Toshi, even though it was quite obvious that he is a con artist. When questioned about aspects of the Bitcoin protocol, he didn't have the adequate technical knowledge. He also wrote a long blog post explaining why he is Satoshi instead of simply proving it with a signature from Satoshi. Um, yeah, I'm not surprised. I wasn't asked why I'm convinced Craig is Satoshi. Um, I posted on, on Reddit. He signed in my presence uh, the private, using the private key from block one. And so that kind of sealed the deal for me convincing me that he does have that private key. Uh, my interactions with him feel like this is the inventor of Bitcoin. Just to sow a bit of controversy for fun, I'll explain why I think he's probably not Satoshi. Two minutes, two minutes. I mean, first of all, very, very simple signaling theory. He had the opportunity to take two different paths of proving, who, uh, of proving that he's him. One path would have been to make that exact kind of proof Make a, make a signature from the, first, uh, from the first Bitcoin block, put the signature out in public, make a very simple 10-line blog post that anyone, you know, including, you know, people, including you know, cryptographers like Dan Bonet and, uh, and Ben Kaminsky and so forth can verify that it's him, and just post that out there and let the cryptographic community do it. Instead, he's taken this path where he's wrote this big long blog post with 200 lines that's so confusing that even Dan Kaminsky said it's too confusing, and tried to get, only show that signature to a, to a few select people and we're supposed to trust them. So, in general, signaling theory says if you, if you have a good way of proving something and a noisy way of proving something and you choose the noisy way, then that means, you know, chances are you, that means you could be, it's because you couldn't do the good way in the first place. Okay. <laughs> Gavin Andresen lost a lot of credibility through this incident. This whole scandal had been a major blow to Gavin's reputation and a huge win for the small blockers. Gavin had given the larger blocker side a major self-inflicted wound and he had nobody to blame for this but himself. Almost in parallel, a second incident happened that helped the small blockers, the Ethereum DAO hack. After someone stole the funds of the DAO, the Ethereum Foundation decided to reverse the chain and cause a hard fork that way. What happened is a split into Ethereum and Ethereum Classic. And while Ethereum is way bigger than Ethereum Classic today, the latter is still around. This was a precedent of what could happen when Bitcoin does a hard fork which terrified the miners. Bitcoin Classic wouldn't be the new Bitcoin and replace Bitcoin, they would both coexist. Bitcoin Classic now looked unlikely to activate in the short term. Ironically, although most small blockers won't like to admit this, Ethereum may have saved Bitcoin. But unfortunately, people have short memories in this space. What happened? Bitcoin Classic lost traction and the big blockers came up with a new idea, Bitcoin Unlimited. The problem with this idea was that next to the block size limit, they wanted to change other things as well, which resulted in a deeply technically flawed project and a less simple communication. At this point the war got more and more heated, people were losing patience and the tension was really rising in the community. The focus now shifted to the idea that the larger blockers would move over to Bitcoin Unlimited and then also attack the original smaller blockchain by mining empty blocks and orphaning any blocks with transactions in it. Jihan Wu and Gavin also made that clear. It may not be necessary to attack it, but to attack it is always an option. Preventing a minority hash rate fork from confirming any transactions is a good idea. They even allocated a budget of $100 million for this attack. If you think about it, this is against anything that Bitcoin represents. But to be fair, the small blockers had some of these shady and immoral actions as well. The next key impact on the block size war was the exchange Bitfinex listing for tourist contracts for Bitcoin Unlimited versus Bitcoin Core. The big blockers always thought they would win once the market can decide which Bitcoin is the better one. Well, it turns out they were wrong in that assumption. The Bitcoin Unlimited token never reached more than 20% of the price of Bitcoin. Finally, at the end of 2017, the Bitcoin Unlimited token expired worthless, so no Bitcoin Unlimited related chain split occurred. So to have a short recap here, first Bitcoin XT failed, second Bitcoin Classic failed and then Bitcoin Unlimited failed. Remember, for SegWit to activate, a 95% minor activation threshold was necessary. This was very unlikely at the time. But next to Bitcoin there was Litecoin, which only had a 75% activation threshold. 
The small blockers discussed that Litecoin could be a good test to run SegWit and the Litecoin community sort of embraced the soft fork with open arms because it meant that Litecoin is a step ahead of the Bitcoin development. But of course the same debate that took place in Bitcoin now took over Litecoin as well. This whole incident also led to a new strategy, the UASF, User Activated Soft Fork. What it means is that users who run a node can signal for SegWit instead of the miner signaling. These nodes don't accept non-SegWit blocks from miners. So if a sufficient amount of nodes signal for SegWit, the miners will have to accept it, otherwise their blocks will get rejected. So far, no user activated soft fork was used, but knowing that this would work ultimately shows the miners don't have ultimate power of the network. Nodes do. The war reached a new level with the New York Agreement shortly after. On the 22nd of May 2017, there was a closed doors meeting in New York with people like Barry Silbert and Jihan Wu. The agreement was how Bitcoin should move forward from here and contained the following. Activate segregated witness at an 80% threshold, signaling at bit 4. Activate a 2 megabyte hard fork within 6 months. This was supposed to resolve the conflict by doing a soft fork and a hard fork, so basically one thing for the small blockers and one thing for the big blockers. But what it really was, was an attack by institutions on the Bitcoin network. As for the small blockers, there was no representation of them in New York and their views were not reflected in the agreement whatsoever. Notably, the agreement made no reference to the idea that Bitcoin users control the protocol or that support of the users was necessary before changing the rules. The New York agreement did not even pay lip service to the idea that users should have a say. It was pitched as the large corporates in the space imposing the rules on the users in a top-down manner. It felt like a threat or an ultimatum. The SegWit activation period was a complete mess with miners flagging all over the place and at the wrong bits or indicating they run a client that didn't even exist yet. However, SegWit did activate on Bitcoin, something that was almost unthinkable for a long period of the block size war. Towards the end of July 2017, Bitmain finally flagged for Bit1, just a few days before the deadline. The small blockers were ecstatic. After a grueling campaign more than 10 months after SegWit was released, the largest miner in the space had finally flagged support for it. Why? Because of the threat of a user-activated soft fork. This was a tremendous David vs Goliath-like victory. In the true spirit of Bitcoin and its pseudonymous creator Satoshi, the user-activated soft fork didn't emerge from an official closed-door roundtable meeting among the big players. Instead, it was released in the open and promoted by a pseudonymous developer Shaolin Fry. Somehow, one pseudonymous individual, a few grassroots hardcore followers and a few heads commissioned by Samson Mo had gone head to head with a multi-billion dollar enterprise, Bitmain, supported by other well-capitalized businesses and won. I remember thinking that something like that could only happen in Bitcoin. So SegWit actually activated, but this was only the first part of the New York agreement. The second part was the hard fork to a 2 megabyte block size limit, known as the 2x of the SegWit 2x proposal. And many industry players didn't want this to be a different coin. It was supposed to be Bitcoin in their eyes. However, more and more large blockers got the feeling that this part of the agreement will fail. So they started to think of new solutions. After Bitcoin XT, Classic and Unlimited, a new coin was on the horizon. Bitcoin Cash. Here's a good point to introduce another character that participated in the block size war, Roger Ver. To say Roger Ver was excited about Bitcoin is an understatement. When he first discovered Bitcoin, Roger is said to have been so excited by the opportunity that he was hospitalized for several days. But who is he? In the early days, he was one of the most relentless promoters of Bitcoin and was more interested in the payments part of the network which made him a big blocker. He was also the owner of the Bitcoin.com website. If the 2x portion of SegWit2x fails to activate, Bitcoin.com will immediately shift all company resources to supporting Bitcoin Cash exclusively. And Bitcoin Cash happened. In fact, it only launched one month after the genesis of the idea. In parallel, some supporters of the New York Agreement withdrew from it because the implementation wouldn't have replay protection which created an attack vector. The large blockers never really supported SegWit2x. Their hearts went to Bitcoin Cash. SegWit2x did not have support from the users. It had no node network, with almost everyone running Bitcoin Core, the exchanges either rejecting SegWit2x or taking a neutral stance. SegWit2x was dead in the water. The small blockers looked set for a sensational victory. It was no longer a question of if, but when. On Wednesday, November the 8th, 2017, an email was sent to the SegWit2x mailing list. The email was essentially an unconditional surrender. 
phase two of the New York Agreement was officially abandoned. And here the war was basically over, the small blockers had won. However, not everyone agreed. Some people, particularly some of the large blockers, interpreted the war as a battle between Bitcoin Core and the miners. In their minds, Bitcoin Core had won and the miners had lost. Therefore, Bitcoin Core developers now controlled Bitcoin. In some people's minds, the idea of a system controlled by end users is too difficult to grasp. Instead, they look for somebody or some entity who controls the system. The last thing to mention in this whole war is Bitcoin Satoshi Vision, a fork of Bitcoin Cash. It's Craig Wright's chosen coin and that's about as interesting as it gets. If Bitcoin is able to scale as a payment system without big blocks is still left to be seen. Lightning is just a few years old and getting consistently better. The El Salvador Bitcoin adoption will be a good experiment to see how far Lightning has come. As always, the small blockers are not in a rush. This won't be the last Bitcoin war. The next one will probably be about regulations, privacy and censorship resistance. However, at least for now, the dream of a world where ordinary people have ultimate and direct control over the rules that govern their money lives on. Thank you for watching.